Uh, welcome everyone to this special colloquium entitled From Experimental Maths to Indigenizing Curriculum. A special welcome to Executive Dean, Faculty of Science and Engineering, Magnus Snyden, um, who graciously accepted uh, our invitation to join. I also just wanted to note that both Vice Chancellor uh, Professor Bruce Doughton, as well as Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic Professor Mary Ellen Herbenstein, will likely attend part of the colloquium and will do so when concurrent commitments allow. Um, We're very lucky to have our speakers with us, uh, Dr. Judy Ann Osborne and Dr. Michael Donovan. Before we, before we begin our colloquium, uh, we acknowledge the traditional custodians of Macquarie University land, the Watamatico clan, clan of the Darug Nation, whose cultures and customs have nurtured and continue to nurture this land since the dream time. We pay our respects to elders past, present, and future. Dr. Judy Ann Osborne received her PhD from the University of Melbourne. She is currently the Director of Computer Assisted Research Mathematics and its applications at the University of Newcastle. Her interests span pure and applied combinatorics, education, and equity. Her interests in practice in education and equity are influenced by her personal enjoyment of research and teaching, as well as her beliefs in diverse mathematics as rightful cultural heritage of all people. Dr. Michael Donovan received his PhD from the University of Newcastle. He is a member of the Gumbangir Nation from the na uh, North Coast of NSW and ac Academic Director, Indigenous Education at the Macquarie School of Education, Macquarie University. He has been involved in Aboriginal education since 1992, working from schools through to university. He has lectured across a wide variety of Indigenous topics and primarily teaches initial teacher education students about working with Aboriginal students and human rights understandings when working with ab Aboriginal communities. Thank you both uh, for, for speaking. Uh, Judy Ann Michael, for, uh, it's all yours. Thank you so much. <laughs> all righty. So from experimental mathematics to indigenizing curriculum, it's going to be a bit of a personal journey for me and for Michael and we'll interleave and we may interrupt each other and so on. Um, we'll see how it goes. We also um, really acknowledge that uh, we are, uh, certainly I am not an expert and there is um, so much to be gained from so many perspectives, including all of yours. So um, we really hope to include that. Yeah. So, um, and oh, now how do I, I need, yep, that works. Um, so we also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet, these virtual lands. So could be really anywhere around the world in these days. Um, it's a really interesting thing. The uh, University of Newcastle's uh, two campuses are on the lands of the Awabakal and Darkin young people. And um, the Darug people, if I got that right, for Macquarie University. And um, I think an acknowledgement of country is a really interesting thing to be doing, I sort of have come to think of it as showing respect, but also as a knowledge sharing protocol. We are part of universities and we have all these protocols and we're doctors and all of this sort of thing about sharing knowledge. Um, this is some part of um, a knowledge sharing protocol that's appropriate in this context, we feel. And as, a, as we're working on a strained environment, you know, it's a, uh highlighting that, you know, Indigenous knowledges um, have existed on this land for a very long time. Um, you know, I'm happy to say, you know, at least 100,000 years on this land mass. And it's something that has not just uh, stopped because of invasion, but those knowledge systems still exist and part of our environment and engage with the Aboriginal community today as much as it was done in a traditional sense. So it's an it's a, it's a important feature for Australians to understand as we progress and develop uh, as, uh, as a society. Yeah. Um, so, yep, there's a picture of Michael and there's a picture of me. Um, do you want to say a little bit more about yourself at this point, Michael? Or? Oh, I have another little side later, but um, again, just these things are really important. I know uh, Judy Ann spent some time in a variety of Indigenous uh, mass forums. We've both done that together. And um, the idea of an introduction is a really important feature because it kind of places you in context to the other person's world. 
So um, as you can see, we've both kind of highlighted who we are, where we come from, uh, to kind of give you some relevance of why where we believe we have the ability to talk with you fellas about this, this topic area. So this is, this is my journey. Um, some five generations ago, most of my family came from the UK and came to Tanamba, which is a little tiny hamlet, a couple of hours due east of Melbourne. And this little bend of the river is, is um, where we have been for the last five generations. This road here is called Osborne Road. Um, after my family. It's a tiny, tiny drop in the ocean in terms of Indigenous timeframes, um, but it matters a lot to me. Um, I went from there to Melbourne University and I did combinatorics there. I then went to ANU as a postdoc where I met and married my husband. And then I came to um, Karma at the University of Newcastle, Computer Assisted Research Mathematics and its Applications. And this um, sketch is of the late Jonathan Borwine um, who started Karma and his good friend and my good friend Beso Youngik. Um, sometimes it's easier to see than to say. And um, that idea of images and uh, a different way into other people's worlds has become really important to me. And I have the honor now of directing that uh, center. So, um, I don't know, many of you probably knew John Borwine, particularly in the maths world. He was this, this human volcano of ideas, just come within a certain radius of him and, and ideas would emanate from him. Um, and students would get, you know, PhD topics just by coming but vaguely close to him. Um, it didn't matter what um, piece of information from the world, just something banal like, um, zipping a file to send it through an email. He'd go, okay, well, this is a measure of information um, and have a different way of looking at it. And um, so he was really interested in computation and the affordances that computers give us, um, changing us and changing how we think. Um, so they're not just tools, they're tools that are extensions of us. We're almost like, um, you know, biotic or something like that. And so he really championed the idea of experimental mathematics. And that's been really influential for me. And this is like a typical John slide. He was a really connected thinker. Um, he nearly decided to do history instead of maths, um, but then decided that he better do uh, maths because if he did history in 20 years time, he wouldn't be able to do maths, but not a vice versa. And he brings that um, perspective to his mathematics and kind of to the sociology of mathematics. And so, you know, his slides be full of interesting vignettes like this. This was some advice to a wealthy uh, German mer merchant in the 16th century. Well, if you only want your son to be able to cope with addition and subtraction, then any French or German university will do. But if you're intent on your son going on to multiplication and division, Assuming he has sufficient gifts, then you'll have to send him to Italy. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of interesting. But actually, if you, if you think about it, they were commuting in Roman numerals. I'm just trying to imagine multiplying X, X, V, I, 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 I <laughs> by itself or what's going on, you know. Um, it was really interesting. Um, Claude Shannon, father of information theory, had this um, throwback computer built in, um, in Roman. So our tools, our representations, they really change what's possible for us. Um, and, um, and that sort of thinking that spans the ages and connects um, different disciplines is really helpful for us in seeing what's possible now and in the future, I think. And so living in um, this karma John world, it was all about changing maths, practice and culture from the inside. Changing, um, so, you know, um, there are lots of things that we take for granted. The way we do proofs, the way we talk, the, all, all sorts of things that, the things that we value, um, 
whether we think it's okay to draw diagrams or not. Is it somehow dirty to draw a diagram? Is it somehow better, higher to just purely do algebra? Are those squiggles somehow higher culture? Um, what things are we allowed to think and what are we not allowed to think? You know, just a couple of weeks before he died, John was massively shaking up the financial world in terms of he'd started a mafia, Mathematicians Against Fraudulent Financial Investment Advice. Um, you know, speaking the truth and communicating and valuing who you're communicating with and valuing kids and art was huge on incorporating. Uh, so in, in Europe, a lot of the grants that you would get, the standard scientific grants, you would uh, be required to produce some public art along with that. So that the public really has that connection and benefit from the grant as well. And these are really interesting ideas. So the idea of changing maths culture was something that wasn't completely strange to me when Gail Tillman, the wonderful Gail Tillman, who at the time was at the Walla Chuka Institute um, at Newcastle, invited me to a yarning circle. So something a bit like this, I mean, it wasn't as good because it was in a, uh, in a room with plastic chairs and plastic tables and so on. Um, but the feel of this random pick that I just got was really very similar to the feel of the yarning circle I was invited to. A bunch of people organized as equals, really trying to share and, and, and nut things out. And Michael, do you want to make a comment or two about yarning circles before I go on here? Yeah, I was gonna actually add that, um... That uh, Judy Ann highlighted the, the most important feature of a yarning circle. It's a circle because everyone gets to face each other. Um, you get to see who's speaking. You get to see, you be able to engage with them because uh, they're right in front of you. Um, but it's also at, a, at a, an even level. Everyone sits at the same level. So there is no um, authority in, in the circle. It is, it is monitored because there's generally someone like Gail at that time would have been managing the discussion and really good managers will also engage every person in that audience. So everyone uh, is given the opportunity to have a say. So a, a good manager will allow that to happen. But it's again, it's a, it's a structure that uh, Aboriginal communities have always used and particularly when it comes to any decisions where they're all sitting down as equals all being open, hopefully honest, and again, facing each other's the attempt to make everything open and honest, but it's, it's, a, it's a really engaging way uh, for a discussion to occur, I believe, I, I think. Well, I was definitely engaged. Mm -hmm. And Gail said to me, well, what we need to do, and said to everyone there, is we need to indigenize the uni curricula, like all of it, um, not just maths and stats in my little world, but, history, geography, medicine, engineering, you name it, we need to indigenize the curricula. And she talked about uh, Universities Australia and um, you know, um, various sort of government things and so on. Um, but also on a really personal level, we need to indigenize the curricula. And so I thought, yep, indigenize the uni mass curriculum. Right, great, let's, let's do that. Um, <laughs> Oh yeah, uh, how, how, how do we do that? Um, yeah, how do we do that? And I don't know how you're feeling right now and I don't know how you're, you felt when you first came across these ideas because I think Macquarie's been very active in this, in this space more maybe than other universities. But my thought was like how? And I thought, well, one early thought I had was, well, maybe it's just not possible because, like maths, it's universal, it's culture free, right? Like, here's some maths, it's in French. Look at all these theorems and section numbers and stuff like that. Do you, like when you say culture, I think um, beautiful food, music, dance, you know, interesting clothes. That's what I think of when I think of culture. So here, I, I think French culture, well, you know, your baguettes, your coffee and everything like that. It just doesn't look like there's any culture over here on the right. So my sort of immediate feeling was uh, that we haven't got any culture. So how can you incorporate any particular culture? And I was sort of, um, sort of stuck there for uh, a little bit. Um, and I wonder whether anyone else, feel free, you could um, 
just pipe up has has felt uh, something like that, especially in maths. We can have various opportunities for people to contribute and so on as we go along. So that's just fine. But I just just thought I'd throw that thought out there because that was really one of the early thoughts. So I don't see any culture here. Actually, when I reflect later on, uh, the theorems themselves are culture, corollaries and theorems and the fact that we've got no pictures and all sorts of interesting things are actually, I think, very strong indications that maths has a really strong culture. But it took me quite a while to come to that. Um, one of the things that helped me was um, an old paper by Alan Bishop. He's an uh, anthropologist and um, I met him first at an Atsuma meeting, Atsuma being the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Maths Alliance. Um, and he expresses this idea really nicely. Um, I'll give you a chance to just read that. Yeah, yeah, and I'm seeing people sort of, the, the people I can see, there's a little bit of body language going, oh yeah, oh, oh, interesting, interesting. Because, you know, on the one hand, two times two are four. <laughs> a negative and a negative is a positive. And when you're in a flat Euclidean space, the internal angles of a triangle do add up to 180 degrees. <laughs> um, it's just the way it is. And there's a whole interesting lot of philosophy. My little boy wants to know where the numbers live. You know, why is it so? Um, <laughs> but then there are all these questions, you know, why actually are we asking these questions and not other questions? Um, I've got a really interesting book on my bookshelf, which Gail gave me, which said that in the school curriculum, we tend to look at number measurement and uh, space in that order. Uh, but if Indigenous people were designing a curriculum, they'd probably look at space, they'd reverse the order and then put kinship above all of those things. So why are we prioritising this and not that? And there's number, you know, the massive emphasis on counting got something to do with our, our economic and political system. And so is it actually stupendously cultural? <laughs> and also in that same paper, uh, anthropologist Alan Bishop went, and went on um, to explore and, uh, a bunch of things to say, well, you know, when you look at different cultures, you actually see really different interesting things going on. And um, I have a Navajo friend who I mean to ask about this stuff here. It seems to be terribly interesting, this uh, idea that Euclidean geometry, it's points, lines, planes, solids, and it's it's atomistic, it's based on the real numbers. But there's this other idea that's not dividable and space is, um, and everything is in motion. This is my little boy and I'm in the middle of a major colloquium, my sweetheart. So you're gonna have to- That's gonna have to get done. See you, sweetheart. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Michael, do you wanna make any comments there before I go on? <laughs> Um, um, not really. I, I was going to talk a little bit more about culture as we go along. But again, it, it was an interesting thing. And again, I have um, just talking with Judy Ann, the, the um, um, ethnomathematics was something that I found really interesting when she was talking about some of John's work. And then highlighting where things, and I can't remember, is it the, um, I was going to say uh, the group of numbers, and I can't remember, the, the Indian guy who... Um, I've gotten, now I'm not a mathematician, so some of the, um, okay. things that all you mathematicians know, I um, always forget. Oh, but you, what you, there's the big secret, Michael, is. Yeah, and yes. again, the idea of some things being westernised. So, you know, you didn't know that other cultural groups have used these patterns before, but, you know, now they're, you know, part of Western knowledge, so it's the right knowledge and all those other things uh, aren't really discussed. They're kind of almost ignored or pushed away to the side because they're not as important as the, you know, the Western understanding of these knowledge systems. Mm, yeah, yeah. It's, really it's the only system you need to know, kind of. Yeah. 
and I'll let you into a secret, Michael. At a colloquium or a maths talk, most people don't understand most of the stuff. Most of the time. Okay. I just couldn't remember the name of the top the, the, the order, huh? <laughs> we'll think it. I'll we'll remember think eventually. It. Tomorrow I'll remember. <laughs> Um, so that was an anthropologist, but this is also coming from mathematicians. Um, there's this really um, philosophical book by mathematician Reuben Hirsch asking what is mathematics really? And it starts with, um, uh, uh, he's having this conversation with a, a 12 year old and asking her, is there a biggest number? And okay, well, uh, no, there isn't. And okay, so there must be infinitely many numbers. Well, where are they? And all of that sort of thing. <laughs> Um, and um, looking at, you know, how many parts does a uh, four cube have? And, well, let's if you try and figure that out. Well, let's see how many parts a three cube has. Well, it has got some vertices and edges and faces and an interior, and we add them up and we get some number and we compare smaller and we generalise and we do all these mathematics, um, all these things that we're so happy and comfortable with. Um, and, you know, asking whether the sort of dominant philosophy of that is really right for describing who we are and what we really do. And even my PhD student, um, now doctor, graduated very recently, a eh? Hazma Shahid, um, was studying abstract algebra textbooks recently. And she found many, she was trying to classify the statements, you know, are they statements of fact? Are they statements of, you know, student do some work at this point or whatever. But she found a whole bunch of statements that just couldn't be classified in those terms and it turned out they were really statements of values. So loads of statements valuing precision, valuing proof, valuing creativity, valuing parsimony. That's just actually, when you look, it seems like there's an awful lot of culture in our world, in our mathematical world. I always, again, talking uh, with Judy Ann, where the... Um... The understanding that you have to you've got a proof for a, a maths concept so you know everyone's defined it and there's actually wonderful clear definition or understanding this is the answer this is the proof so we've found it it's done but then someone will challenge it later and work out well no it's not quite you can actually change it and i love that a proof is you know like almost the end result but then every now and then they get changed again so it's not like you know the, the knowledge and the understandings re-evolve again so sometimes the maths language um, kind of gives that definite there is only one answer possible, which, as mathematicians prove, there really isn't. There, you know, proofs can be challenged and changed. Yeah, yeah, it's so generative. And sometimes I think we unfortunately hide that, particularly in the school curriculum. And it's mm. something I've got to do something about. So before I muse further on how to indigenize, I just want to talk about this. So I've just met and interacted with the most amazing range of amazing people through thinking about this and how to do this, of course, Michael, but also um, Kathy Butler and Tammy at the Wallachuga Institute and, um, and Nathan Towney, who's our um, PVC Indigenous and Dan Collins and Henry Fowler of the Navajo people and Edward Doolittle of the Mohawk people and um, the chair of Atsuma, Chris Matthews and, uh, and um, Jade Kennedy from Wollongong and then more people from Wollongong, people from um, UBC, Mark McLean and Beso and, and a whole range of, of, of people, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, um, really interested in this and doing great thinking together. So I just, I really appreciate those people. <laughs> um, and I, 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 there's a wonderful community to join. Michael. Oh, me. Um, and again, I, I didn't introduce myself at the start. I tend to try to do a little introduction. Um, I do this, as I mentioned at the start, because when, particularly when Indigenous people talk, uh, engage with other Indigenous people, they, you know, the first question they ask for, you know, who's your mob, who's your family? And that's a really important feature for Aboriginal people to, to find context for who they are in relation to that other person. Um, in an academic world, I actually also explain who I am um, as well professionally so that, uh, particularly if I'm talking to students, they get to see, you know, my history so they can say, well, this guy might have some relevance and be able to engage with me or teach with me at some level. So for me, these are really important Indigenous factors. But again, that idea of introduction is not just purely Indigenous. It does have a, a very important feature to put 
put you in context with um, people you're working with. Yeah. So again, um, the only thing that I think is really worth noting there, um, one of the organisations that I've been heavily involved in is the New South Wales AECG, it's the Aboriginal Education Consultative Group, primarily talks with school groups, um, but early childhood and higher ed also engage with the AECG in New South Wales. Um, and I think that's a, an absolutely wonderful organisation. Okay. Oh, next slide, thanks. Um, and again, like Judy Ann, I have a, a little bit of a journey. Um, and so I get my journey is uh, generally not planned. <laughs> So as it says there, I kind of stumbled into this journey. And, you know, um, as the second point heads, I was kind of finishing up my PhD and I had done some research. And, you know, again, uh, I don't, not really great at developing that clear academic pathway and the, the development of the plan. I was trying to work out where to go next. And one of the, the features that I was kind of looking towards, I realised that there was money being uh, in the STEM field. And again, uh, Indigenous knowledges is where my understanding sits, uh, well, pedagogy primarily. Um, my PhD did talk about uh, pedagogical understandings of Aboriginal students and, and what needs to be considered when engaging with them. So pedagogy was something I really followed, but because of that, cultural knowledge was a very um, important feature of that. Uh, and again, I've worked in, uh, up to that point, I've been working in a School of Aboriginal Studies for 20 odd years in higher ed and had done a lot of work across a really wide spectrum of um, uh, courses and understanding. So I had a really nice sound foundation. And the sciences did make sense to me in relation to engaging with Indigenous understandings. You know, Indigenous understandings are, are about our world. Um, and, uh, you know, STEM is about our world as well. So those alignments were very, for me, seemed to align very, very easily. Um, I always forget that Indigenous understandings is not part of every day's lot, every, every person's life and understanding. Um, if you, it should be within New South Wales particularly, because, you know, again, our educational system has had uh, a mandatory uh, policy of engaging Aboriginal education, and it has had since 1987. So again, so that should that means that if anyone in the audience was in a school any time after 19 uh, New South Wales public school any time after 1987, then they should have had Aboriginal understandings presented in every key learning area. So they should have had Aboriginal understandings presented right through their educational um, history, and that, that that was mandatory in 1987. Again, it hasn't really happened. Uh, when they reviewed it in 2004, they realised that um, it really wasn't happening and they've tried to make some changes. And us discussing here is a kind of a, a follow-on from some of those changes because higher ed is also making those changes as well. But we'll talk about that a little bit later as well. Again, part of that, I, I was involved. I'm going to go back one slide. Wow, I didn't have a good back. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I, I um, went into ATSMA, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Mass Alliance. Um, again, I found it really interesting. They had a conference. I thought I'd visit and see um, what it was all about. Um, I presented a, a, a very, very brief paper about uh, Indigenous knowledges and maths. And um, that was kind of starting a, a bit more of a formal journey. To, um, again, Judy Ann and I both attended the event and, you know, sitting over meals, talking about some of these uh, understandings was really valuable for me. But it, it's led to a few other little things. Uh, we've um, applied for an internal grant together. Again, lots of, inf and that led to lots of informal discussions with uh, the MAX fa faculty. Uh, we presented some work, some of those discussions later on in, in um, at a conference and published a, a conference paper out of that. We have applied for some other exter larger external grants, which weren't successful, sadly, but that's uh, an ongoing process, I'm sure. And then hopefully those discussions have built a little bit further to, um, you know, uh, starting to develop a, hopefully to develop a textbook in relation to indigenizing maths. But again, we're starting that process as well. So again, a lot of these are starting processes. Thank you. Oh, okay. Um, and Macquarie has a, a very unique place within these discussions. Um, because, uh, you know, in 2017, when they decided that 
Uh, there is a need for change in the Macquarie curriculum uh, and the curriculum ar architecture was developed. Uh, and uh, again, I was not a staff member at the start of this process. And I've spoken to many, many uh, academics who were in that process. You know, most of the academics and particularly course conven unit conveners, um, you know, started pulling their hair out and then rewriting curriculum. Um, one of the one of the better parts of this uh, process was, from my understanding, because again, I started as in Macquarie as the academic director of Indigenous teaching and learning, and I started seeing the Indigenous understanding being valued at an institutional level. Now, again, people like um, Bruce and uh, Mariella, who was then kind of one of the um, the uh, well architects of the whole curriculum architecture. Uh, yeah, they really push these understandings that um, Indigenous understandings are important for all our students, important for all our graduates, so that when they step out of this university, they'll carry with them some understandings professionally about how to engage with and work with Indigenous populations to improve our society by looking at communities of disadvantage and you know leading towards some uh, better success within our communities so again I was I, when I stepped into Macquarie I you know fell in love with the institution almost immediately because of the what I keep saying the values of the institution particularly the values of the executive to try to engage with these processes okay thanks Julianne so, where, how, okay, we were convinced we should indigenize. Where to do it, how to do it. I am someone more advanced along the journey to where I was when I went, I don't think it can be done. <laughs> um, but I am very far from there, but I shall sort of um, throw up some of the um, ideas that I have stumbled across, that Michael has helped me stumble across, that um, Kathy and Tammy and others have helped me stumble across um, when I'm thinking about this sort of thing. So one of the grants that um, Michael and I and others got together was about pedagogy. There's a, um, a wonderful institute at Newcastle called CEHE. It's a Centre for Excellence in Equity in Higher Education. And they offer a bunch of, of really interesting grants where they don't just give you money, but also mentorship and time talking to other people and so on. Um, and uh, we put forward a proposal that okay, indigenizing maths and statistics, in some ways it seems quite hard, but there's something that maybe we can do, which is look at how it's taught, look at the pedagogies. And there's various different um, models of indigenous pedagogies. Um, one in particular was created by Tyson Younger Porter in his thesis. Um, and he has an eight ways model of indigenous pedagogy. And Michael, would you like to speak to this a little bit? Yeah, um Tyson's Eight Ways of Aboriginal Learning um, is a model of design from his country originally um, through the relationship he had with his community. Um, it is just a really nice framework that pulls together many cultural understandings of Aboriginal people. So they talk about the idea of narrative being very important. They talk about connections to country. They talk about um, there are more than one way to, 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 to learn a piece of information. Learning isn't just an answer. Learning is a journey. Um, to get a part of that journey, you need to actually look at the whole picture. That, but at other times, you need to deconstruct that picture and find the small elements. Um, but when all of these understandings are put together, they need to come back to community as well and have some relevant to the student and re relevant to ongoing engagement with the community. It's a really engaging framework but again like any framework it's it's a whole framework that you need to kind of work across constantly and again you're not always going to be highlighting every aspect in every actual learning but it's a really good uh, good tool to play with and again our discussions we're using that as a central point for our discussions led to some really good uh, understandings across a, a large cohort of um of peers you know talking about um where where to go why we should go that way um, how we can do it. Yeah, yeah. And then also looking at this framework and reading about it, I felt a connection too as a mathematician because so many of these things are so natural in mathematics. I mean, symbols and images, 
patterns, patterns, symbols, images. You could almost say it is maths um, as, a, as a definition, you know, um, storytelling. Actually, you, once you realise there's culture in maths, you realise where we're yakking on about our stories and um, and who we are and how we relate to each other all the time and um, you know this this non-linearity um, certainly our proofs are because we're trying to see can you actually break a chain and so we've got it as a chain but our knowledge is this massively networked connected come around at it this way that way see it almost as a landscape sort of thing come in at the middle um, give an example go out you know generalize specialize and so um, I found points of a connection there that um, were just really natural to me as, as a mathematician. So even if the actual content seems um, tricky to indigenize, the, um, the, the pedagogy the process, seemed like, yeah. the process seemed like a place that um, we could work from. Um, Again, then, the interesting part about it, it's not an answer. It's actually a process and a journey, which again, as an Aboriginal person, I found that really valuable. But again, um, working with the maths community, I found that um, it was a, an understanding that a community could work with really well. Um, and I, just a little add to the community. Community is really important with the Aboriginal community, with Aboriginal society. Uh, and you know, I, I always think about myself as a community, as part of a community. When I started hanging out with mathematicians, I actually realised that mathematicians tend to see themselves as a community as well. So um, for me, it, it just made sense um, quite clearly working within uh, this very diverse range of uh, mathematicians because you know, they see them, even though they're statisticians and abstract and applied mathematicians, it is part of that, that larger community, but you know, they're you know, not part of academia, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. I feel, you know, validated and seen when you see that. Um, it's great. <laughs> then there's just, just fundamentals of, of, of justice and the injustice that's been done over such a long period of time and some really simple things that we can do um, to, to try and sort of um, fight back against that, as simple as an acknowledge of country, even in a maths class. Um, as simple as, well, you know, there's this phrase, you can't be what you can't see. Um, indigenous knowledge is not all dead, old knowledge in, that only dead people have. It's contemporary. There are contemporary indigenous mathematicians um, to be able to try and bring in some of that work. Some of those examples um, is something that um, I think is possible to do. And just basic stuff like having high expectations for everyone and um, trying to connect with learners' worlds. And I'm sure Michael will expand yeah. later on when he's talking. And just because they're all just quick elements of justice, as, as Judy's, um, Judy Ann's highlighted there. But again, these are nice little steps because, again, if you're unsure where to begin, you know, even a simple step of you know, making an acknowledgement to country so that if an Aboriginal or, uh, uh, student is sitting in that, in that classroom, they're actually saying, well, you're making some connection to something that is valuable to me, you know, identifying that, you know, this country has always been uh, part of Aboriginal society. And again, it's, it's a small step. And again, hopefully it's not the only step, but, you know, those little steps are, are ways to begin the journey. Yeah, yeah. And there, there are ways to begin that are less potentially fraught like, so so content is where everyone tends well not everyone but um certainly a, a natural first question is okay the content um if we were doing plant science we might um really legitimately call upon the plant science knowledge of the local indigenous community if we're doing maths it's not always as um as obvious i think there is content um that can really naturally be included that can really enrich the maths curriculum. And I think there are places to find it. Um, I also think there's a bit of a risk of being tokenistic with content, um, some cutesy little example, as opposed to something that really feels mathematical. But in terms of places to look for um, content that could be really rich, 
I, I think there's some probably some really interesting group theory, graph theory going on with kinship. I think that there's probably um, there's going to be some um, maths and astronomy and navigation, um, Aboriginal people being superlative at that. And Rowena Ball, who is um, a mathematician at um, ANU with um, Celtic and Australian Indigenous heritage, um, has given talks about an Indigenous Fourier transform. And I'm going to make it to one of her talks one of these days because I'm really curious. So I think this actual maths content, genuinely deeply mathematical content, that would be really interesting there. There's another thing which is to look at Indigenous science and cultural practice and to analyse it with maths. And I think that's also potentially legitimate, but also potentially more fraught because it's like doing math. So you could might do the maths of the flight of a boomerang or something like that. Um, and I, I, I personally think that that's, that's interesting, but potentially quite fraught because it's kind of doing Western maths to this indigenous something um, as opposed to highlighting indigenous maths. But I don't know, Michael, do you have thoughts on that one? Um, I'm sorry, I was thinking of another uh, uh, further point. Sorry, I lost lost train of thought then. Sorry, I missed that one. No, no, that's all right. I was just talking about the distinction between looking at Indigenous mathematics versus looking at Indigenous pra practices with a Western mathematical lens. Just... Yeah, uh, that's, that's again, one of the, the more difficult practices to kind of engage with because um, if you're trying to engage another deeper uh, cultural understanding if you really want to engage with it more fully you've actually got to take some depth in investigating not that that tourist view that that surface understanding and so again it's not like looking at western maths i mean indigenous maths with a western mindset you've actually got to attempt to uh look at an indigenous understanding when you take on these uh these principles so again it, it it's it's something that is not easy to grab straight away but it's, it's something that takes part of that process and those collaborations with particularly Indigenous people to gain those understandings. Michael, you just beautifully made my point in yellow. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the thing that I've found the single most useful thing is as a non-Indigenous person to try and learn about an Indigenous worldview and apply that to my thinking about all of my teaching. It's just this incredibly refreshing thing to do. I remember the first ATSMA that I went to and I learned this sort of revelation that Indigenous thinking is, is holistic, this is well known, but holistic in the sense that um, knowledge is connected to place, is connected to ethics in a way that you cannot separate, that you must not separate. Whereas in, in um, Western knowledge, we know something over here and then we think about whether it's right to apply it in that way over there. This knowledge is fundamentally integrated and, um, and that's really made me think quite differently about my teaching and ways that we will unpack a little bit. And I'll just, just before we jump on, there was um, Judy and I know quickly discussed about, um, she was talking about calculus being the link between high school and universities. And um, I, I'm sure I've done calculus at some stage coming out of high school, but I really don't understand it and I still don't understand it. But um, Judy Ann sat down with me at one stage and she started uh, talking about it and she was drawing triangles and explaining everything to me. And I was understanding elements of it, but, you know, not really grasping it. I made a reference to a friend of mine who was my, one of my PhD thesis um, uh, supervisors. And he said, oh, um, oh, calculus is easy. So he picked up a, a, a set of keys off his desk and he dropped it. And I said, and he looked at it, he started talking about um, calculus is about that movement. And just that one comment thing, oh, wow, that makes sense to me. The idea of movement is about understanding, because I'm the, maybe there's a triangle that threw me. Then I turn up at Atsuma and um, Chris Matthews is doing, uh, in between a, a talk, pulls out a piece of string and a pen and he starts drawing circles. Then he goes from circles to waves and he starts talking about those waves being calculus. And he's sitting there with an 11 year old boy. Everyone's gone off to do a presentation. So it's a 40 minute session. We've come back. This 11 year boy comes back and explains calculus to the audience within a 40 minute discussion with Chris. Um, so he found a context 
for this person to understand, this student to understand. And again, an Indigenous context where they both make related to. Yeah. And uh, tragically, all too often, um, students uh, can do calculus in the sense of being able to do calculations, but actually don't know that it's got anything to do with movement or change. Yeah. Um, and that's important. And that's terribly, terribly, terribly important to us as mathematicians and engineers and, and everything. And I can see on people's faces. Um, I'm gonna have to scoot along a little bit. Yeah, we better move. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so Michael and I gave a, a joint talk at the uh, Ostermess Lunchtime Learning Ser Seminar series. And um, there was this slide from Wendy Hanlon that Michael had put up, which says, um, when a teacher asks a question like from a story, how many children were at Nikki's birthday party, Aboriginal students might answer Natasha, Billy, Sam, Greg and Susie. Um, and then the teacher's maybe going to mark them wrong because the teacher's expecting the answer five. Um, and there's this question about cultural um, influence here. And, um, and Hanlon's comment is, well, the, the student clearly understood the text. But I was a bit sort of perturbed by this because I, I thought, okay, good, they understand the language. And if they didn't, we could probably show them a video. But, but I was worried that they really should count because I worried that they were not mathematicizing. And sort of behind my, you know, when, when I teach first year uni and I actually teach counting and the fundamentals of it and bijections and when I'm counting the birds flying by in the sky I make this this mapping a number one I associate with one bird a number two with another and a number three with another and because I've got that exact association one two three that's why I say there's three and that's somehow what I was wanting the students to really get um, and I wanted the students to get threeness it was not caring about the five kids at the party uh, or the three birds in the sky. I wanted to know the three birds and three apples and three balloons and so on. There's a fundamental threeness to this. And three is so beautiful, you know, uh, triangles, the frustratedness of triangles, all of the things that happen with three being not an even number and the way we build up numbers and so on. But actually, I realized that I missed something terribly important. Um, and there's this lovely book, Welcome to My Country, Lak Lak Barawanga and, and Company. And she describes um, life up in Arnhem Land and a bunch of people going for a ride in the troop carriers to go and get, uh, collect some um, turtle eggs. And she says, if one of you asked us how many people are going on this trip to gather turtle eggs, that person would reply. Now I'll give you a, a second to read all this. I make a guess when people have got to the end. And then she says, well, you might have been expecting a simple answer. There's 18 of us in our group. But what we've answered is the Yongnu way. And it's really a better answer because it's getting at, at kinship, which is the heart of everything. And without kinship, you don't have any world or meaning or order or balance. And um, this is um, a, a kinship diagram of the same family from a different book by the same set of authors. Um, so when we were asking these Aboriginal students to give us the number and leave out the, the relationship information, oh my goodness, we're actually asking them to do something culturally almost illegal. We're asking them to leave out the most important information and just fragment this isolated little number. And the whole uh culture is is about the connectedness and, and for me that was a revelation that's what we're just doing here here's another example of um you know like i'm really fair dinkum about whether they're allowed to leave structural information out or not this is um an example from a a, a very old book um uh, by pam harris and she's studying um 
um, the language of, I think, the was it the Walpuri? No, it was a different group of people. But anyway, when the people were speaking about uh, movement, you have to include the directional information. You're not allowed to say the baby is crawling. You have to say the baby is crawling on the east side. The sentence isn't complete without it. We might need to just run on so we can have a couple of questions. Yeah, yeah. Um, so instead of asking how many kids at the birthday party, maybe ask deeper questions. Who's at the party? How many is that? How might you mathematically depict that relationship? And then all of a sudden, we're not not—we're getting the math that we want, but we're also getting deeper maths. It's sort of the difference between a multiple choice 50 question um, right wrong answer exam versus the type of exam that has five questions, all of which are actually rich. Um, and by the way, um, let me skip that. This Welcome to My Country book talks a lot about maths and the authors include one person from Newcastle University and two people from Macquarie. Um, so you got- Two geographers, I think they are. They are two geographers. So um, the, um, the, the sisters of Lack Lack, that's Lack Lack there, um, are all in um, Arnhem Land and then they're adopted um, sisters and granddaughter and so on uh, are these people so you've got amazing um, resources right there at Macquarie and uh, maybe we have to skip yeah we can just skip that one skip um, Atsma is useful um, the Australian Council of Deans of Science has got something useful going on and of course Joe Perry one of the awesome people who was at uh, Newcastle and is now at Macquarie the Academic Director of Indigenous Learning and Teaching and thoughts, questions <laughs> open to well, you <laughs> thank you uh, Mike, Michael and Judianne for, uh, for such a wonderful talk um, if, if anyone has any questions, uh, please feel free to unmute yourself. Thanks, Judy and Michael. That was um, that was that was fabulous. I do worry about um, incorporating things and then them being tokenistic. So it's really good to kind of hear a perspective on how we can connect with that philosophy so that it, um, that it's better. So thank you very much. It was a good talk. Welcome. Are, are there any other questions? I would just say there's a question in the chat. Oh. How do sorry. uni teachers, especially at Macquarie, learn about the Indigenous worldviews and how to indigenize their curriculum? That's from Natalie. You want to speak to this, Michael? I, 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 I did make a quick response, but it, it is, it's, um, actually this week I've had two high schools um, maths um, faculties ask, you know, how, what, what can I do to kind of indigenize my math curriculum? And again, the idea is they, they'd love to have a, a resource so they can just grab and use in the classroom. And there are resources like that exist, as, as Judy Ann highlighted, there's a couple of resources you can, you know, going through Atsuma and the Australian Council of Deans of Science. But I think the part that both Judy and I try to highlight is it's it's more than that it is about the journey it is about some pedagogical understanding myself you know me I'm a teacher and you know pedagogy is the absolute bread and butter when it comes to learning more than the content and that's something that I constantly argue but I think the the, the way to engage your audience is much more important than just the content adult learns are slightly different because they've chosen to be there so I tend to talk to um mandatory school age students, about mandatory school age students. But again, it's about that journey to get there. So, you know, having some, and I, I realised there was something I did miss there, Judy Ann. Also community is something that you also talk. So the relationship is really important. Talking about country, having the ability to reflect on learning is a really difficult thing for all educators, but also students. So it's something you need to kind of engage with as well. And again, you've got to go through an Indigenous standpoint, which takes time. Again, for non-Indigenous people, you need to kind of develop those partnerships with people like um, Joe and uh, to, to kind of work out where we can go. Thank you. And I found people to be super welcoming. Um, 
Joe for the brief period I knew him at Newcastle <laughs> and um, obviously Michael. And this, um, you know, um, I, I was at the Australian Council of Deans of Sciences um, launch of their website um, yesterday. And um, I, I met a couple of people from Macquarie University um, who were there. So there is a community of people within Macquarie University. And if you can find those people, you talk to Joe or reach out to Sandy and Kate and, um, and others. And, and I believe it, just in the chat at the start of this, in the conversation before the uh, recording started for this meeting, I think um, some of you were mentioning some colleagues that you know already who may wish to, um, to mention some more now uh, about links that you know of um, within Macquarie and beyond. Well, um, I have a question regarding um, educational books for uh, non-Indigenous uh, teachers, say, um, teachers of mathematics, especially Judy, and probably you are more equipped with to answer this question. Uh, if there are uh, books like that to prepare um, teachers, future teachers or our students, if they are doing maths and going to teach um, indigenous students out in countries, so um, um, if there are resources. I can give a partial answer to that. Um, the um, this book, by the way, the Welcome to My Country book, is actually a book about mathematics. So Sarah told me that the publishers would not let them put the word maths anywhere on the cover, anywhere that anyone might realise it was about maths. Not to scale thought, off. No, right? <laughs> <laughs> but the whole book is actually about maths. So it's, it's and it's lovely, it's worth a read. Um, one project that I have at the moment with um, Michael and uh, many of the others in the um, people slide, almost everyone in back, back, yep, almost everyone here is um, we're working on putting together um, a book on indigenizing university mathematics and um, we um, have some themes and teams of editors um, who are shepherding those, those themes and each team of editors has at least one Indigenous person, at least one mathematician, obviously some people are both. Um, and we're going to have a, um, a symposium on the 20th and 21st of September at Wallatooka Institute at Newcastle and, and everyone is welcome. Um, to call for um, submissions to that book and to talk about it and to try and help build some community there. So that's a, a sort of a future work in progress. Um, and um, you're very welcome to come along to that. And Michael, do you know of resources? Um, I mean, oh, At Ratsama has a heap of resources. Yeah, that was gonna be the point I was gonna start at Ratsama. Um, again, much of it is school, um, school-based sort of stuff that I know. Um, some of the um, departments of education, the Western Australian Department of Education, South Australian, the Queensland Government's Department of Education does have resources and some of, I um, can't remember which ones have more maths than other areas, but they all do have some really good resources. The New South Wales Board of Studies has a variety of kits and I think they have some stuff with maths as well. Um, and... Yeah, they're just a couple off the top of my head. There's that one about Murray Maths, which is Simone. Yeah, it's Queensland, yeah, Queensland yeah. guys, yeah. Well, Paul Lissart here has opinion about the example uh, issues with coming, sorry, uh, uh, counting. Uh, sorry, you Nino, yes. Um, I just want to, so we are a bit over time. I, I'm going to stop the recording now. But um, I'm more than happy to keep this Zoom open. Like it's, uh, it obviously, I think a lot of people want to want to keep this going. So I'm going to stop the recording, but I'll leave the leave the session open. Um, well, um, 